Thank you, Todd. You must be exhausted by now. At least I, I have a good sleep. night's sleep. Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, and uh, thank you also to Tammy Howe and the other IARC organizers that invited me to present what I should have presented last week in Vancouver. It's nice to be here at home behind my desk presenting for you, but I would have liked to be in Vancouver last week as well. And thanks to Aphasia Access for putting on this amazing event. I was online and followed most of the start until I went to bed yesterday. And uh, then I started with Linda Worrell in my ears at 6 a.m. Uh, this morning in the gym. And uh, I will talk to you about co-designing, implementing and evaluating conversation partner training for health professionals in hospitals and community services. Um, I'm based at University of Southern Denmark and I have also here included our uh, project logo and the Danish name is Comtil and it's short for communicative accessibility in Danish, kommunikativ tilgængelighed and it actually also means to give someone a chance. So uh, I think it has sort of a nice uh, dual meaning. And uh, before really getting started, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors of this presentation, our funders and many collaborators and co-designers from various organizations, including uh, the Stroke uh, Organization. And uh, a little about uh, the context uh, that, uh, that this project is done within. Um, we have two regional hospitals here within the Red Circle, where I am based on the west coast of Jutland, the mainland of Denmark, uh, one covering acute neurology and the other neurorehabilitation. And uh, sort of the intake area of those two hospitals are five municipalities providing community care after hospital. That's their role. And uh, the municipality is very, very much in size from that little island that you see uh, here, almost in the middle of the picture. They have 3,500 uh, inhabitants. And then the, the biggest uh, municipalities in this area is Espia, where I live, and we have uh, 115,000 uh, people living here. And I've also taken a few pictures with me. We are sort of the, one of the holiday destinations uh, in the country. Um, and uh, yeah, lovely white beaches and lovely culture and nature, but uh, often very cold and windy. So it's all started with a nurse at an acute ward suggesting the stroke team should be taught conversation partner training. However, since the evidence for health professionals using uh, supported conversation in acute and rehab settings is not that strong, we ended up with the aim of creating a more connective and cohesive rehabilitation journey for people with aphasia through better communication, despite transitioning also across sectors and meeting a lot of different health professionals. We have a big change in Denmark when you leave hospital and go out into the municipality. And it's often uh, a place where there's a great risk of losing a lot of information and yeah, all sorts of things. However, what we, uh, we aim to do could potentially include partner training and other things, improving communication and accessibility, depending on we, what we together with our co-designers. And in this case, the co-designers was people with aphasia, uh, family members and health professionals, depending on what they would suggest, design and decide to implement. Um, I have chosen not to give a big tour of the theoretical background uh, today, but focus on our local background and context. But I could have uh, elaborated on how people with aphasia are excluded from decisions around their health care, how they have poor, poor health outcomes, how they are at greater risk for adverse events, uh, getting back into, hospitalized, uh, into hospital after being discharged, and many more things. And often due to aphasia and that um, hard communication uh, that follows um, 
having aphasia. Let me try to explain this wild and rather messy journey we have been on. First of all, I should tell you this project was never intended to be a research in an experimental way. The grants we got was for service improvement, but me and a colleague from the university's public health department got invited in to contribute with our expertise and make sure that the service improvement would build on evidence uh, and that the used methods in the project would be scientifically sound. At the bottom of the slide is our three phases we usually describe this project in. And above, I've tried to name activities, not all, but many of uh, what I would regard as uh, essential activities. As most other projects, we had an extended phase zero, where ideas were formed in a quite large project group representing all stakeholders, including representatives from the local stroke association. And we were lucky to secure funding. And then we could start phase uh, one in July 2017 with making a rather classic ethnographic study of the current situation and the literature uh, targeting what was identified as problematic uh, in that ethnographic study. The findings from this um, sort of more classical part of, of, of a study or of a project uh, was the starting point for the next phase, phase two. Uh, and I will show some examples of the findings in a minute uh, and also explain uh, a bit more about the phases. But phase two was based on co-design with people with aphasia and family members and healthcare professionals across the spectrum from acute care all the way to community care. Um, we started out with co-designing ideas, prioritizing what we wanted to develop further, and then we had a development and test uh, phase. Uh, this was all quite iterative, um, and that phase took us a bit more than a year actually to complete. Also more about this work in a minute or two. And then we were ready to start implementing what we had developed. And I will today primarily focus on our communication partner training for health professionals. And now back to phase, uh, phase one. Apart from searching the literature for inspiration to build upon in the first phase, we made observations of communication between staff and people with aphasia in hospitals and other health uh, settings. Additionally, uh, we talked to some of those people about their experiences, needs and opinions of communication support and accessibility in the system. We have many more findings from this first phase, but in short, people with aphasia emphasized that they would like increased involvement to feel safe and feel that they are heard, seen and understood by the staff. Family members also wanted to feel safe and to know more about how to support their family member with aphasia in communication. And staff primarily requested better communication skills and tools to support this. Based on what we learned in this first phase, artifacts for the design process were made. Some examples are here uh, a map of a patient journey or of how a patient journey could look like. And it looks heavy. It's a very, very busy uh, slide up here or a picture up here in the corner. And it is complex to be a patient and being transitioned between different stages and different organizations and institutions. Uh, and then we also had uh, below here um, an example of a persona. Personas that can best be described as standard persons reflecting who a person with, a, in this case, a person with aphasia, a family member or a health professional, professional could be. We also created so-called opportunity rooms of rooms of opportunity that is uh, small uh, summaries based on the observations and interviews in the first phase and where we could see opportunities for further development related to our aim and I should actually say a lot of that ethnographic study and the sketching of the opportunity room was not made by me or the other researcher but by anthropologists in uh, like a health innovation agency in this region here. So they were very naive to everything to do with aphasia and aphasia services. And I actually think that's a nice, um, a nice thing to bear in mind because 
I would come very biased and have a lot of ideas what I would uh, think would be good. But uh, this is really based on uh, naive observations. And here's some snaps for, from the co-design phase. That was really the fun part. Together with our co-designers, we started brainstorming into those rooms of opportunities with the patient journey and those personas we have made in mind. And after pitching ideas, we, we voted to narrow down to a few ideas and later uh, the ideas we had voted for um, had to be translated into either a storyboard or a prototype. All this happened in a rather iterative process, as I have already said. And also alternating between design workshops with health professionals and design workshops with people living with aphasia. And to make sure that people with aphasia got the su sufficient space and the right opportunities to take part in this, we were always in, uh, they were always in their own group, not with family members or professionals. And they always had an SLP student uh, or an SLP to help them supporting uh, their verbal output. And it was trained, uh, trained support. Um, and, and we used uh, in this phase also many different types of methods um, to create uh, all those ideas. We ended up choosing seven of the preliminary ideas with our co-designers uh, and they have all been further developed. Here's just some of them. It, one was a visible symbol of aphasia, a clinical guideline, uh, and actually the clinical guideline is, is uh, still under, uh, under development. And then uh, conversation partner training to health professionals and a toolbox to support those specific health conversations. Uh, the next step then was to develop it all. And it is all done apart, yeah, as I said, from the clinical guideline. For the other ideas, we've been working with a publisher, an app developer, a marketing company, a video producer, and then of course, amongst us in the project group. Before moving to this third phase of implementation, we and the co-designers tried to verify and test if the new solutions could work as intended. And maybe I could also just add a little story about uh, making the symbol. The symbol um, was actually a suggestion from a group of healthcare professionals. They would like some kind of symbol to go on, 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 on the room uh, of the person on a ward or on the journal or, or not the journal, the, yeah, whatever sort of to identify uh, we have now to do with a person with aphasia and you should use support conversation, uh, you should support your com communication with this person. And what they had drawn in the beginning was a little speech bubble as a symbol. And then we took it to the people with aphasia and also the healthcare professionals, should I say, was quite worried if it was stigmatizing uh, to put a symbol up. Um, on things relating to that person, particular person with aphasia. So we took it to the people with aphasia and they said, no, it's not stigmatizing. We would love that to meet people that know that I have trouble communicating. I have problems with my language and will immediately start to, to alter and support the communication with me. So they thought it was a great idea. They hated the speech bubble though. They thought it's not indicating what this is about. So they got this idea about making a, the speech bubble into, into like a brain shape. And uh, the three dots was then a suggestion from, from the design people we worked with. Uh, because that's the international symbol of something is coming. So please wait. And then it was also very important for the co-designers with aphasia to, uh, to have a green symbol because that's the color of hope. And some results from phase uh, three that I'll focus on uh, in the rest of this presentation. Based on our co-designers key terms, that was having a health related conversation as a place to make relations, to show respectfulness, to show honesty, also in the hard and unsuccessful parts of the conversation. We developed what we call our basic training package. It's called 
the, the basic training package because we also have a train the trainer package. I'll mention that a little bit more um, in a minute. The training is inspired, or perhaps I should say it's building on other programs, especially supported conversation for adults with aphasia from the Aphasia Institute, but it's tailored to the results from the co-design phase reflecting local context and needs. The training lasts for uh, three hours times two and approximately two weeks between to give t uh, time to practice the skills they're learning. Um, first round is more theoretically heavy than the second time. And we have a last, large emphasis on variation in the training. So a few lectures, a lot of videos explaining different uh, things and demonstrating different things, role plays, reflection time, group discussion, and many other activities. When you are a trainer, you would have this material at hand, so a set of slides for the two, for the two uh, training um, episodes, eight videos, and what is really novel here is it's in Danish, reflecting the Danish context. Lots of Danish clinicians are trained in SCA from Toronto, and um, they often complain about, or their receivers of the training uh, complain about uh, showing English videos or Canadian videos, but in another language and not really representing the type of conversations they would usually encounter when they are working as an OT or a medical doctor or whatever. And then we have sheets with different uh, tasks on. We have a role play bank, as we have called it. We encourage to, to dive into the role uh, play bank and, and adapt whatever is there to uh, the specific local context they are teaching in, or maybe to develop a new role play and upload it into the role play bank. And then a toolbox with the material, uh, with different materials, and I'll tell you more about that, and then a training manual. And uh, the status of the training, uh, we had, uh, we started with the train the trainer program. So we had 18 trainers trained across disciplines, which I guess is rather novel compared to many other uh, CPT programs. So it was not just LS, uh, SLPs trained here, it was OTs, it was PTs, nurses, and also so one nursing assistant and she was she was good she was actually the best i thought so reflective and a wonderful nursing assistant i would i would love to her have her um, taking care of me if i was uh, admit admitted to the neurological ward here uh, down the street from where i live and it was a six-day training program with lots of development of the basic training built in. So we were not really at that point finished um, making the, the basic training. So we got a lot of feedback input from the trainers in this, uh, in this process. Um, and then they went out, those 18 people, and, uh, at, and did the basic conversation partner training for staff. Um, who are meeting people with aphasia in hospitals and municipalities. And by the end of 2019, where the project officially uh, should have finished, uh, 223 people were trained. I know they continue to train. I've just been down to the local hospital for the last few days to make interviews. And uh, some of, of the nurses I interviewed had just attended the courses. And I was very happy that all the nurses I interviewed actually also mentioned Comtil. So, so they, they know the method, they know the strategy, and, and that was even despite the interview was not really about that. The Train the Trainer uh, course is supposed to continue as a CPT course at the university, so we can continue to train people outside of this regional area. Um, and as I've said, the trainers continue to train their colleagues out uh, in their workplaces and other organizations around them. And then uh, we also had uh, a box of materials developed. It's a personal box that are given to people with aphasia at the stage where uh, a need is identified. So often it would be at the acute uh, ward, but it could 
also be later on. Maybe um, they're not ready to have that toolbox in the beginning or use that toolbox uh, in the beginning. And it's actually meant, it, it, or the reason we give it to the person with aphasia is uh, mainly of hygienic uh, reasons so that, um, so that it's not uh, a, a box that goes with each member of staff because that would not be good for, and especially not uh, during those COVID times we are having now. So the materials follow the person with aphasia and they, but it's intended to be used by the staff so, to support the health communication. And some of the, the content is uh, listed here, but mainly the material is uh, designed to support a health related conversation. So we, in our training, um, we say, if you're going to talk about other things, please go out, find, uh, find other materials, look what they have at the Aphasia Institute, use that. A lot of that has been translated into Danish. Go on Google Pics, do whatever. And uh, on top of the box for people with aphasia, we also have pocket cards uh, for staff. And then uh, a few minutes on the evaluation. Um, we, this is where we are now, or have been more or less now. We have been doing a big round of evaluation at the end of 2019 when the project was scheduled to end. However, we actually have money left or had money left, meaning that we are actually working with the continued implementation and maintenance throughout the whole year of 2020 to make Contil not just a project, but a sustainable method used every time a member of staff in this area meets a person with aphasia. Uh, but let's have a look at the effectiveness part uh, of the evaluation. We used uh, the health professionals and aphasia questionnaire. It's a questionnaire that has been developed recently uh, in Denmark by myself and uh, my colleagues Eben Christensen and Lisa Rondrio Jensen from University of Copenhagen. It's a 16 item self-reported outcome measure. Uh, measuring knowledge, skills, attitudes and emotions, practice and environment. And we have done it at three time, time points. So uh, two post-training measures and one uh, pre-training measures and one post-training measure uh, eight to 12 weeks after. And we actually hope to repeat it um, this fall around a year after the last training was given. Um, yeah, back in between October and, and December last year. So a few results from, from the, that questionnaire. This is uh, showing the mean score for every question at the three time points. And as you can see, um, all the green bars are higher than the blue or the red ones. And it was meant to be that. So lucky us. And I'll dive into a few of the questions questions here. So question one, how well do you think you understand what aphasia is? So do they perceive that they have greater knowledge of aphasia? And the answer is yes, they do. And, uh, and especially important of, uh, is to, yeah, to, to, to watch the difference between AB and then C because C is the, is the post measure. And then question two, how much knowledge do you have about how to communicate best with people with aphasia? And the same counts here. Um, they have greater knowledge now in how, to in how to communicate with people with aphasia. But of course, we would also like to, to, uh, to ask them about, yeah, you have knowledge, but are you actually using the knowledge and the skills you are having? And since it's not an exam, it's really just what they report back to us. So question four is, uh, is more a skill thing. Uh, if people with aphasia cannot say what they want, I have some strategies to help them express themselves in other ways. And we also have a question five about understanding. If a person with aphasia cannot understand what, what you are saying, you have some strategies and we also have a question six about uh, if we don't, uh, if I'm unsure, if we have understood each other, I have some strategies to help me checking that. And then question eight, I'm confident that I can communicate with people with aphasia, which is really nice that that has also improved. And a last question I will show to you in my daily communication with people with aphasia, I always use strategies to ensure we understand each other. 
not always for all of them, but many of them are saying yes to that or, or score themselves high. So that, that is really, really neat. I can't really conclude anything since we are still walking the walk, but here are a few things to keep in mind based on our experiences and results. So there are things that are hard to change through training. For example, the level of frustration when communicating with a person with a fashion and it's not successful. Time issues, uh, it's hard to get time to prepare a conversation or actually to sit down and have a conversation uh, with a person with a fascia. Even though I just heard in the recent interviews I made this uh, week that under or during the COVID-19 lockdown, um, they have had more time and, and they have really spent that time also on communicating uh, with people with aphasia. Uh, and then some attitudes are also hard to change. Uh, in training. Some have been changed, others not. And despite addressing the different sectors or services from the beginning to the end, it still becomes the gap for the person with aphasia when moving from hospital into community services. It's often another level of expertise. There are more staff out in the municipality, less resources, and certainly a smaller proportion of trained staff, unless you live on that small island that I showed you in the beginning, because most staff in that municipality uh, working with people with the aphasia, I, I, I think I can almost say all staff that would meet a person with aphasia are trained, whereas here in Espia, where I live, it's, uh, yeah, I wouldn't even guess, maybe one or two percent or something like that. And then we don't know yet how this is anticipated by people with aphasia and their significant others. So some of the next moves is actually to investigate that, to investigate the perspectives of people with aphasia. It's a new grant. We have been, uh, or we plan to start uh, doing the data collection in March. That is postponed now, but we have actually just started last week to doing sort of the, the first observations. And then we are right now working on sustaining the changes in the hospitals and progressing them in the municipalities because the changes I believe we have seen are uh, greater in the hospitals and not so big in, in the municipalities. And then we have the clinical guideline. Um, that we are developing for the hospitals and we are also trying to investigate if the five municipalities are interested in similar guidelines. It's because it's different systems, so they don't work under the same guidelines. Um, and then we have some future plans, but they are not yet funded to spread co the conversation partner training to carers, to the emergency room. They actually was with us in the beginning of the project, but then they left the project due to time issues and the whole pre-hospital phase. So, um, so ambulance drivers, uh, paramedics would be very nice to, to get on uh, a, a course as well. And uh, hopefully also the local healthcare students. And that was it. Thank you. Please get in touch for further discussion. You can contact me on email or Twitter. <laughs>